over the last 14 years that I've been in the NHS, funding has always been uh, the hot topic. On this occasion, I fully understand and appreciate uh, why uh, the NHS is currently striking. We've got to be stopped being used as a political punching bag. Welcome back to the National Health Executive Podcast, giving you views, insight and conversation with leaders from across the health sector. I am your host, Louis Morris. Hello and welcome back to the Finger on the Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Louis, and today I'm joined by University Hospital Southampton's Director of Estates, Facilities and Engineering, David Jones. David, how are you? Hi, I'm very well. Yourself? I'm absolutely fine. So, David, David, before we get into anything in particular, how did it become that you work in NHS and why Estates specifically? Tell us the life story, if you like. So I have been in facilities management all my life uh, since I left school. Uh, I started off in hotels, uh, first off uh, doing a number of different services. Uh, And then after I returned to university, I went into contract catering and contract facilities management services. And about 14 years ago, I took voluntary redundancy from a corporate organisation I was working for in the city. uh, And an opportunity came up in the NHS uh, within Guys and Tommies. Uh, I've been here uh, within various roles uh, over the last 14 years within the NHS, uh, the last six of which has been a, a Director of Estates and Facilities uh, in three different trusts. Uh, and uh, for the last three of those years, I've been at University Hospital Southampton. I saw you mentioned catering there, and I was doing some brief research that you were a guest lecturer at King's College London, talking yep. about catering and NHS and dietitians. Could you tell me a little bit more about that, what it entailed, what you taught people? Yes, certainly. So that came about uh, when I was at Guys and Tommy's as head of catering uh, and King's uh, College reached out to me asking me to give some uh, brief lectures to dietetics undergrad postgraduate students uh, around what it is like to run a uh, catering facility in a very large uh, hospital. Uh, The dietetic programme used to contain a number of weeks uh, on site at a hospital for each student. That's been stripped out of their programmes now uh, and it uh, basically came down to two hours of me standing in front of them trying to give them a flavour uh, of what it is like running uh, a healthcare uh, catering facility. How was it? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's very good. I don't mind uh, doing lectures. I don't mind uh, speaking about things that I know about. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was it was very good. Speaking of studying, I see you're also on the opposite side, I think, I believe. You're a, you're a PhD student at the University of Southampton. What are you studying there? What's going on? Uh, Over the last couple of years, I've really wanted to do some research into the effects of backlog maintenance uh, on the environment, on uh, our service that we give and on the patients. So uh, back a year and a half ago now, I'm in my second year at uh, University of Southampton, undertaken part-time PhD, and my research topic is exactly that. It is looking at the effects of backlog maintenance on patient harm within the NHS. What have you found so far? The last year and a half has been predominantly uh, literature review and research methodologies. And throughout the literature review, I've uh, looked at, uh, overseen uh, about two and a half to three thousand articles on patient harm in all various different guises uh, across uh, the uh, uh, healthcare across the world. Uh, and one thing I've noted is that there is no research done uh, on patient harm uh, due to the healthcare environment and backlog maintenance. So this, the research that I'm doing is uh, quite unique uh, in its field. Uh, and hopefully uh, we will be able to find some link over the next uh, couple of years uh, between backlog, the amount invested into hospitals and the effect that it is having uh, on uh, patients. Uh, the BMA recently released a a study undertaken of their uh, members, uh, which had uh, some very significant concerns raised around the environment uh, and how it is affecting them undertaking their job. So would you say, in the the of backlog though, would you say backlog is the NHS's biggest problem? There's a whole spate of issues at the moment. There's workforce issues, retention, there's backlog, there's demand, I mean everything, there's patient waiting times and the environment. What would you say is the NHS's big issue? 
So I think that is very much based on your perspective. Uh, so yeah. obviously I'm in a state and facility, so I'm going to say backlog is a major issue. Uh, if I'm looking wider than that, obviously staffing, staff retention is a big issue uh, and funding uh, is also a, a very big issue uh, for the NHS. It seems to be a perennial one uh, over the last 14 years that I've been in the NHS. Funding has always been uh, the hot topic, uh, but certainly to try and resolve both staffing and backlog maintenance, funding is absolutely key. Moving slightly to your current role as Director of States at University Hospital Southampton, what has been some of the work that you've done that you're most proud of, that you'd most like to share with the world, I suppose? So I think a couple of things for me uh, since I've joined here, we've had a really good focus on compliance, a uh, really good look at where we are with backlog maintenance. We're in uh, the fourth quartile of the worst uh, estates for backlog maintenance, uh, and we've been able to demonstrate uh, quite succinctly to our trust executive and board uh, the need for increased funding, uh, and we've received that, and we are working on a five-year program to remove all of our high risk and significant risk uh, uh, backlog. Um, we've also undertaken a, a, a two-year study on our master plan for our next 10 years and have come up with a 10-year forward view on what UHS needs uh, to remain relevant to its local community uh, as a both a DGH and a specialist uh, training provider. Um, and I think the, the most recent one we'll hopefully be announcing in the next uh, couple of weeks that we've uh, managed to get a grant uh, for uh public sector decarbonisation uh, of a significant value. I can't say what the value is at the moment, but yeah. it is, it's going to be a game changer for us uh, on site. You mentioned the sort of 10-year plan there about what yep. UHS needs to do. What does UHS need to do for the community? So we need to grow our hospital. So not only do we need to refurbish our retained estate uh, and make it more relevant to uh, uh, what uh, the uh, clinical services are providing in the 21st century, uh, but we also know that we need to grow uh, our certain services such as oncology uh, because the demand is going to start outstripping what we can deliver uh, in the near future. Uh, so having a very clear estate strategy uh, that's wrapped around the master plan so we can continue to keep pace with growth uh, in the local community. And I don't know if you do too much networking with your fellow estates colleagues, that's a big thing in the NHS. What's some that you've seen from some of your peers that has inspired you or impressed you the most that you think, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do but I think one of the first things that come to mind is the work that Newcastle is doing on sustainability. Uh, they've very much led the way within the NHS, uh, making it a cornerstone uh, of what they do uh, across all their business, not just in estates and facilities. Uh, and for me, that is absolutely key uh, going forward, that we have to grapple with sustainability uh, and how we decarbonise these very large estates across the country. Um, I suppose the, the next for me is uh, I, most of my career uh, within the NHS I spent in London uh, trusts uh, and the one thing that London trusts do very, very well is network uh, across acute trusts uh, across London. Uh, given the the expansive space we have between our trusts uh, on the south coast, that's not always necessarily possible, but I am linking in with the uh, Southampton University uh, estates team and looking at what we can do working together uh, to support both, uh, both students and both patients. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. sort of all parts of the countries that you mentioned, Newcastle are at the top of England anyway, and Southampton sort of the bottom, and London the capital. What yeah. are some of the biggest differences yeah. you see yeah. in yeah. health inequality yeah. and health disparities yeah. and things that are getting done yeah. in between the different regions? I have to say I'm not that close uh, to health disparities, if I'm being brutally honest with you, so I probably wouldn't be able to comment on that. In terms of working practices then, so you got Newcastle at the top of the country versus Southampton, yeah. what would you say is the biggest difference, if there are any at all? Uh, not nothing huge that I've seen. I mean, we talk uh, as uh, senior leaders within estates and facilities. Uh, there is a group that meets on a regular basis and talks about uh, practices, issues that we've got. Uh, 
The South Coast, I would say, is struggling with recruitment significantly uh, at this moment in time. Uh, we know that it is being felt across the whole of the NHS, uh, but obviously if you look at the catchment area for recruitment on the South Coast, uh, half of our catchment area is cut off because of the sea. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that has uh, been a struggle and continues to be a struggle for uh, for myself and my colleagues uh, across the South Coast. Uh, other than that, uh, I think those the that's the main thing that I've seen. You mentioned the sea there, and I was reading something the other day. It was about recruitment, as you say. Is, is England or the or, or the UK, sorry, in general, is relying a lot on overseas lot recruitment? Overseas recruitment. Yeah. I don't know if you're well placed to comment on that, but would you say that's a good idea or a bad idea? Is it sustainable? So I, I certainly know from a clinical perspective, overseas recruitment is a cornerstone of a number of NHS trusts. Um, and I think as long as the standards are comparable, uh, and you know, we, we certainly have a shortfall of people coming into the NHS, coming into healthcare within the UK, uh, I know it's been recognised in clinical areas that the drop in college take up uh, of uh, positions uh, in the UK has significantly dropped over the years. So, you know, from a clinical perspective, I can understand the imperative to do that. Uh, from a, in states and facilities, it's not something that we have explored. It's not something that we have gone out um, wholesale, if you like, uh, to uh, various countries to look at. Should you do that, go overseas? Well, I think we need to look at exactly what the cost benefit is of that. So if you need 100 nurses and you know you're going to have uh, 80 nurses on average leave every year, you can go out to a country and recruit 100 nurses and put a campaign around that uh, and it will be cost effective. Within local estates and facilities teams, uh, and my team is 300 strong, uh, but of that it is a very wide mix of uh, estates, facilities, security, waste, etc. So to target, to put a uh, programmed targeted uh, recruitment campaign together, uh, it probably wouldn't be cost effective to do so. Uh, that said, when we do recruit, we don't uh, bar people from overseas. Uh, we had a, a recent project management uh, vacancy come up and we had three people that were uh, being interviewed from overseas. Uh, and obviously modern technologies such as Teams, et cetera, makes that much easier to do. And it makes, us, uh, it, makes it much more possible to reach out to a more global network. Now, since we're talking about recruitment and therefore the workforce, I feel like it's my obligation to ask every time, no matter what, about industrial action and the strikes. What is your sort of perspective on the industrial action? If you want to comment, you don't have to, of course. No, that's absolutely fine. So, uh, as a manager, uh, I obviously uh, uphold the uh, right of people to strike. Um, and uh, on this occasion, I fully understand and appreciate uh, why uh, the NHS is currently striking. Um, I know that there's a lot of focus on nurses and junior doctors at this moment in time. Uh, however, you know, We've also got to remember that this is uh, across the board and it is all all colleagues such as IT, estates, facilities, etc. Uh, that have received uh, below inflation pay rates um, and that is not sustainable. I have uh, two members of my own team uh, that are below the breadline and we are providing support too because they cannot, uh, at the moment they have to choose between whether they drive to work uh, or whether they feed themselves uh, and that in this day and age is not acceptable. Uh, I would also note that uh, this year uh, we, the NHS decided to give managers, 8As and above, only a 1.4% pay rise. Uh, that has made it incredibly difficult not only to recruit from outside the NHS uh, and to show uh, people from outside that the NHS is a serious uh, recruiter for, pe for people in the profession that want to develop their career, 
but it's actually uh, stymied a number of colleagues within the NHS from actually going up to that next level. Uh, I've had one gentleman flatly refuse to go from an 8B to an 8C, as an example, because the pay grade uh, difference was just not worth uh, the additional responsibility being taken. So. I, I appreciate and I understand why people are striking uh, and uh, there is something that needs to be done around uh, pay and benefits within the NHS to make it much more of a, an attractive uh, employer. What do you think needs to be done then? What could be done? So I, I think for me, that there's two things that I certainly would focus on uh, in terms of the recruitment that I do on a regular basis. One is pay flexibility. Uh, the NHS has great pension and benefits, uh, but we are not comparable with the wider country with corporate services around the actual take home pay, which is really biting at the moment for a number of people. So we need to be more flexible uh, as an organisation on how we remunerate our, our staff. Uh, and the other one is how we then bring people up through the grades. Uh, the change in ASC terms and conditions, uh, meaning that some managers have to wait almost five years before they have a pay rise that isn't inflationary, uh, is quite significant. Uh, and is turning a lot of people off to the NHS. So I think there are some things that we could do to make things more flexible. Um, so the overall cost to the NHS is the same, but the benefit to the employee that needs the certain benefit at their, their time of life, as it were, uh, is uh, much more attractive. I was speaking to a health leader the other day, and they made a point about uh, the NHS is a people-centric people business and it's patients, but people right. often forget that the actual staff are people as well. So, so do you think that people need to be... Um, focusing on retainment or attention, sorry, as well as recruitment? Yeah, I think certainly uh, it sometimes takes a back seat. The NHS is a uh, dominantly a re reactive service. We do an awful lot of our uh, good work when things start hitting the fan. Uh, you know, take COVID for an example, uh, the, the NHS really came together and delivered an amazing service to the country. Uh, but we do quite often in the melee forget about our staff. Uh, within my team, we have not only a recruitment uh, team uh, that ensure that we're going out to the right areas, ensure that we're hitting the right markets, but we also have a retention and a succession planning team. Uh, so we're looking looking at uh, every, everybody from Bantu maintenance assistance all the way through what their current training and skills are, what their potential future is within the organisation. And we work with our staff uh, to try and give them the opportunity to develop. Do you think the NHS needs to focus more on the younger side as well, in terms of grow people into the NHS? Because, if you, because yep. I think somebody said to me, it, it takes longer to make a doctor than it does to retain one so if you, if you start young and grow the seed if you like is that the best way to do it yeah, and it's exactly the same in the states and facilities. Yeah, most of my uh, staff are in the 45 plus age bracket. Uh, we have uh, about a dozen apprentices within our team uh, and we're really investing in how we bring people on uh, and how we then develop them on site because we recognise that there is a shortage of skilled engineers, there's a shortage of skilled managers uh, and even up to directors of estates and facilities, there is a shortage within the country uh, of uh, of my position uh, and we can only fill that if we get people out of school college university uh, and develop them uh, in the nhs way and retain them within the nhs so not necessarily within uhs but within the wider nhs keep them within the family just we're talking about the future in a way and we've talked about the past and the present what do you see for your future specifically What's your, what's your goal? What's your ultimate aim? My immediate goal in the next two to three years is to uh, successfully complete my PhD uh, without going absolutely crazy. I uh, need to decide to do a PhD, sorry. 
Why? Uh, because I feel, well, firstly, I wanted to do some research. There's not enough research being undertaken within estates and facilities. Uh, I contacted the NIHR uh, about a year or so ago and asked how much money, how many grants were given to research in estates and facilities over the last five years, and it was zero. Uh, so, yeah, this is, while we talk about staff being our biggest asset, the the infrastructure of the NHS is our second biggest asset, and we just are not looking after it as we should. And that's why I was really passionate to do a piece of research. And the easiest uh, mechanism to do that in was a PhD, uh, because it, it supported uh, and guided, uh, as it were. Uh, so I think for me, next next two to three years complete my PhD uh, and then uh, I want the results of that to be publicised so you know, the NHS understands what we need to do to make a difference within our second largest uh, asset. Uh, thereafter, I honestly don't know. Uh, my uh, uh, my career is going to be within the NHS as long as they want me, um, and uh, I've probably got about 15 years until retirement. Uh, so I've still got a few years left uh, within uh, within the NHS, uh, but I I've not mapped that out beyond the next two to three years at the moment. Your answer ties in quite nice for the next question, and this is one of those horrible questions for you. Let's get out a jail ones for me. If you had three wishes for the next five years for the NHS, what would they be? The first and foremost is sufficient funds for the NHS to do what it needs to do. Uh, so it needs to uh, remain relevant to the needs of the population of the UK. Uh, so we need money to build new infrastructure, bring in new staff, train staff uh, and retain staff as well. So I think for me, the biggest one has to be financial. Uh, the second one is uh, and this is probably uh, probably a bit too political uh but we've got to be stopped being used as a political punching bag uh, for two years everybody stood outside and clapped for the nhs and the excellent work that doctors nurses and support staff did uh, in uh, getting the country through covid but immediately after COVID was stood down, all of a sudden, uh, we we're a, a political football again. Uh, and you know, it was back onto waiting lists, back onto A&E targets. And there's a reason why there are long waiting lists post COVID. And uh, A&E uh, you know, is, is through, uh, waiting lists are through the, uh, sorry, waiting times are, are through the roof. Uh, and we need to focus together on how we resolve that, not just criticise and, and critique uh, what the NHS is doing, because that's then leading to uh, good staff actually exiting the organisation uh, because they don't want to work in a toxic environment. Yeah, you mentioned a political punching bag, though. Yeah. And does the coverage in the media affect you? I suppose I'm a member of the media. Does the coverage of the NHS, the media, people say NHS needs reform? needs to be completely done with. Does that affect that staff? Affects that affects staff you? That yeah, absolutely. There was a an article uh, about uh, two weeks ago now uh, by a, an MP who I'll name la nameless, uh, but the, the comment he he made was basically that all the NHS senior management were uh, a bunch of idiots. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, I hasten to add. Yeah. Uh, and I, I drafted a very long uh, response to that that I was going to post on LinkedIn. I, I've since filed it under B for BIM. Uh, but, the, you know, if, if people keep on kicking staff within the NHS, there will not be any staff within the NHS to continue doing the work. There is nobody that I know within my organisation or any organisation that I've worked in previously in the NHS that comes to work to do a bad job. Uh, but the circumstance is, and the pressure that is put on my colleagues, uh, my team uh, and the wider NHS means that we cannot deliver the excellence 24-7 that we want to. Um, and it's how we, how we support the NHS in resolving that. Yeah. And I know I'm, I'm very conscious that you're a very busy man and you've got research to be doing and you've got much better things to be doing than talking to me. So I know I invited you on the podcast, but do you have any final thoughts for our listeners before we wrap up? I think for me, 
certainly from an estate facility centric perspective, I know this will be going out to uh, everybody in NHSE. Uh, we've got to remember the, the environment that you're working in. Uh, I know that uh, the, the estate is not, across the country, uh, is not where it needs to be in many, many hospitals and healthcare environments. Uh, and we need everybody to pull together to make that better uh, and make that work. And whether that's pressure within organisations, within government, uh, or whether it is just working with my colleagues, the state facilities colleagues, uh, more closely uh, to deliver what we need to deliver. Uh, we are seen quite often as the backroom boiler guys, and we're not always at the front and centre of uh, financial, political and uh, organisational conversations. Uh, the fact that no, oh, sorry, the fact that not many direct of estates and facilities are any longer on trust boards is concerning to me, if I'm honest with you, um, as it means that we are not there when key, some key decisions are being made. Uh, I'm very lucky here, even though I'm not on board, I have a very good uh, executive team uh, and I feel that my view and the view of my team uh, is very much heard uh, all the way up through Trust Board. Uh, however, I know that's not always the case uh, in a number of organisations. So it's how we get that representation of the NHS's second biggest asset all the way through the NHS uh, so we can start making changes. So it's more fun than it's a bigger platform. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's been the latest edition of the National Health Executive Finger Post podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time.